Hello, BookTube. Your BroTube movie rankings are back. <laughs> if you remember, you might remember that Grammaticus Books and I did a head-to-head -head mashup of favorite videos for science fiction and then fancy and then uh, action and whatnot. Uh, multiple lists where we didn't always agree, but we decided to make our lists and put them forward anyway. Uh, and we're doing it again. And the latest category is Sword and Sorcery. With the one and only rule, which of course is designed to be broken, being that the movie must contain both swords and sorcery. Uh, and it, Grammaticus Books has put up his video, and I want to put up mine. I have to, I've been told that Michael K. Vaughn is also going to be joining us. I haven't seen Mike's video yet, but I have seen Grammaticus's. And I thought we'd go through his choices before we get to mine in much the way that the city council judge at a high school science fair has to get through the crap-ass paper mache fake volcanoes before he can get to the really good exhibit city judges. He has to go through those first. I thought we'd go through Grammaticus's list uh, and correct it as best we can. <laughs> so his... Uh, he did 10, starting with 10. His number 10 is 1982's The Beastmaster, which is awful. Uh, he, he insists... I understand that he loves the 1980s. So do I. Uh, it was the last decade in which all the world made sense. Uh, but you don't go to the 1980s for... Mo Sword and sorcery movies need special effects. You're not going to go to the 1980s for special effects, especially something like Beastmaster, which is just so awful. It's just so, so, and he goes back even further for his second one. 1958, Ray Harryhausen, The Voyage of Sinbad. There are several yardsticks you can use to know whether or not someone is film broing you, as opposed to giving you a legitimate list of their favorites. One of those yardsticks, and we'll get to it, will be that in justifying one of their picks, they will mention the director's cut. If anyone on any list ever mentions the director's cut, you know that they have chosen something that is unwatchably bad. <laughs> they, they didn't watch. They didn't re-watch. They just watched the director's cut. Same thing is true. Another yardstick definitely applies to the seventh voyage of Sinbad, which is when the family is all gathered together and you want to pop in a movie and watch it from start to finish, not appreciate it in your mind, but watch it from start to finish do you ever watch the movie in question? The example that came up earlier in an earlier list was, of course, Fritz Lang's Metropolis, which is praised uh, by Dude Bros and Film Bros six ways from Sunday. No one has ever watched Fritz Lang's Metropolis from beginning to end. And certainly, on a raucous family night, when everyone wants to be entertained, you will not even think of putting it in. Same thing with this. Same with Seven Voyages of Herky Jerky Sinbad. You won't even think of putting it in. And then we go to 1983. This one I kind of sort of saw coming. This is Ralph Bakshi's Fire and Ice. Um, which is a mess. It's just a conceptual mess. I at first thought last year I learned that there was a comic book. That someone was making a comic book set in the world of Fire and Ice. And I thought, all right, well, surely a comic book will allow you to flesh out the incredible vagueness of all of this, but no, the comic was just the same thing, just, just, just a plastic sword and sorcery product. I'm surprised that wasn't what the movie was called, just sword and sorcery product. Uh, and then we go, we're, we're go to uh, Dragonheart. Uh, this is Rob Cohen's movie with Dennis Quaid and uh, a big plastic dragon. It's, it's. <sighs> Uh, what can I say? <laughs> Grammaticus's taste in movies. Uh, it's not very good. Also, I might point out, I, I've heard around the peripheries of these BroTube movie matchups, I've heard people say, you know, Steve's a good book critic, but I thought I would point out that the rule, the motto on this channel is Steve is always right. Notice what's not there? Not Steve is always right about books. Right? Okay? Steve is always right about everything. Everything. Even women's lingerie. You, Lily. <laughs> uh, Dragonheart is terrible. It's incredibly boring. Then, uh, number six, uh, Grammaticus books pick, pick, picks uh, Big Trouble in Little China. John Carpenter's book, for a movie from 1986. Which doesn't really strike me as sword and sorcery. Uh, you got the sorcery there in, in bucket loads. Maybe he's... 
I mean, there, there, I think there is, if I remember correctly, a little swordplay in the movie, but it's not... It seems like he's squeaking this one in under technicality. If he can do it, so can I. So I have a technicality in my list as well. Then, his number five. <sighs> he Later on in his movie, he has Russell Mulcahy's Highlander from 1986. Uh, and I haven't watched Michael K. Vaughn's video yet, but I feel relatively certain, 60-65% certain, that Russell Mulcahy's Highlander will be on Michael K. Vaughn's list. But the number five on Grammaticus Books' list, I am 100% certain that it is on Michael K. Vaughn's list. 100% certain. I'd be willing to bet you five Boston cream pies. I am completely certain that, like Grammaticus Books, he has John Borman's 1981 piece of crap Excalibur on his list. I do not understand. The weird Benny Gesserit effect this movie has on heterosexual men. I do not understand it at all. It is awful on every level. It may have the record for the largest number of great actors who turn in horrible performances. That It may be the record for any movie that's ever been made. The cast is as good as a cast gets, and they can't, they can't act hungry in front of the craft service table. I, I, I honestly, I know I always say semi-jokingly that the dude bros love Robert E. Howard's character Solomon Kane not for any reason except the hat, the Puritan hat. And you know, that same part of me honestly wants to say that the only reason these, that dude bros ever love this movie is because of the movie poster. It's a very, very memorably artful movie poster, but the movie itself... If you were born in the 21st century, watch it. Just, or just play it and see for yourself. Watch it on your wall-sized plasma screen TV and see what it does for you. I predict it will do nothing for you. It is absolutely awful. Um, and then uh, Grammaticus Books goes on to number four. Ray Harryhausen again, 1981, Clash of the Titans. I'm a little bit conflicted out of bashing on this movie. Just a tiny bit for a reason we need not get into. Uh, I certainly can work around the one part of the movie that I can't objectively criticize it's pretty sleepy this movie is pretty sleepy it, it has it, it has achieved uh it achieved pop brief pop culture parlance in the last six years because it has the phrase release the kraken and it also has a couple of megawatt heavy stars in it doing lamentable work they i honestly they don't seem like they know where they are or what's going on. <laughs> that maybe they're, they don't even know they're being filmed. They're just catching them at home in the kind of drapery that they usually wear. Now see, I managed to bash the movie. I am I can bash the special effects, what little there is of them. Harry Harryhausen is overrated. Uh, and I also managed to bash the cast without ever getting close to the thing I can't bash, which also happens to be part of the cast, and we will just move on <laughs> to number three, to... Grammatics is number three, which is Highlander. Uh, I'm going to issue a heresy here. I think it's hilarious. I haven't watched Mike's video yet, but he has made a habit in, when he joins us in these videos. He's made a habit of just completely dismissing my own picks and my own opinions on anything. He made a, one of his recent videos on this. And he said, you know, Steve Jobs a pretty good book critic. But when it comes to movies, I, none of you are allowed to agree with him. I know all. Steve knows all. Steve is always right. And Steve's controversial opinion here when it comes to Russell Mulcahy, he's, he's Highlander. Why does it sound the way it does? Why does it sound the way it does? This guy had thousands and thousands of dollars to spend on his movie. Why does it sound the way it does? When Clancy Brown is is trying to be all punk ass, you know, and really bad walking down the, the nave of a church, I can hear the delivery trucks in the background. You couldn't screen that out? A five dollar microphone on eBay will screen that out. But but uh, my heretical opinion about this the Russell Mulcahy's crappy Highlander movie is that the TV show was much better than any of the movies. And any remake would have the potential to work. I'm amazed it's been so long. I'm amazed that 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 the Hollywood powers that be have not remade this before now. Usually when you remake something, the key will be, does it still have purchase on the public imagination? If you revisit an IP, you, re you revisit an IP if the public can immediately know it. Even if it hasn't been an active IP in quite some time. So, on the one hand, that would mean you would never revisit uh, 
the never ending story <laughs> or Willow and Willow's been revisited. No one knows anything about Willow except weird hipster fans, but Highlander, even if you don't know where it comes from, you know, the phrase, there can be only one. And the basic premise of Highlander before Mulcahy ruined it, uh, is very good. It's very elementary and simple. And yet Hollywood has not remade it. I don't know, quite know why. I wonder if it's just a tangle of rights or whatnot. Uh, so on the one hand, I'm thinking, gee, this would be really terrific to see remade. Although I thought the TV show did a great job, just a great job with it. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't want it remade by 21st century Hollywood because you and I both know what that will look like. There's no doubt about it at all. There's, there's no choice in the matter. All the zealots are in charge. So I'm not sure I'd want to see it. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, Grammaticus books goes on to number two. John Milius's Conan the Barbarian with an unbelievably miscast Arnold Schwarzenegger, an unbelievably miscast James Earl Jones, an unbelievably bad movie, murky, turgid, uh, dumb, dorky. And what does Grammaticus mention when he's talking about it? The great director's cut, dude. <laughs> but if you, if you listen to the director's cut with Milius and Schwarzenegger sitting there bashing the movie, rightfully so. All of their criticisms are very spot on. It is a bad movie. <laughs> uh, but for his final pick, the best sword and sorcery movie, Grammaticus picks something that I don't think there can be any argument about, and that is Peter Jackson's original trilogy of Lord of the Rings. I could, I could see one potential argument here, not for the quality. Lord of the Rings is incredible. Absolutely incredible. If you've ever been over to Hyde Cottage here for Wine and Calzones, I have certainly dragged you through uh, the fight with the Balrog in Fellowship, the relief of Helm's Deep in Two Towers, and the ride of the Rohirrim in The Return of the King. The ride of the Rohirrim being one of the greatest sequences ever caught on film of any kind. I've certainly done that. I will certainly drag Grammaticus books through that if he ever deigns to come over here for Wine and Calzones. No, the... the quibble that I would have or the bit of hesitation that I that I would have. I don't have it myself. But I could picture, for instance, Michael K. Vaughn having a limitation, a, a, a bit of a hesitation here, is calling it sword and sorcery. Which you would think in a way wouldn't be a reservation because everybody uses swords and there's tons of sorcery all throughout it. Fantasy, yes. I don't know. I, an, an old, I mean, Michael K. Vaughn is our king of pulp. He's, he's an old style pulp guy. I am I am woefully certain of some of the movies that will be on his list. Excalibur will be on his list. I guarantee it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Highlander probably, but I'd be willing to bet he would probably balk at calling Lord of the Rings sword and sorcery. But Grammaticus Books does not, and that is his list. And as you can see, the 1980s got him into trouble just as surely in the 2020s as they did in the 1980s. <laughs> so where's the affection coming from? I don't know. But now that we've gone through his list, then we get on to uh, the science class geek and the list a definitive list the definitive list of the best sword and sorcery movies which is of course my own list and i'm going to start in 2007 with marcus nispel this will not be the only time he appears on this list uh and i'm going to start with my fudge if grammaticus were to put little big trouble in little china on his list then i should be able to put this on mine even though there's technically no sorcery in it it's a movie called pathfinder and as long as we're talking about highlander it stars clancy brown and Carl Urban, a young dreamboat Carl Urban, uh, who's in the New World. He's in the Americas. And there are these weird, towering, unbeatable aliens, basically, attacking the New World. That's where the sorcery comes in. They don't seem human at first. And they are Vikings. They are Vikings that come to attack this world. I don't... Uh, this movie was a flop. A major flop. And I don't understand that. It's totally satisfying. I don't know. I don't understand why it isn't liked. Uh, but I love it. And if I think it just barely counts as sword and sorcery. For a little bit, you wonder if those towering guest intruders are natural beings. So that kind of sort of counts. Then for my number nine, I'm not straying far from the director. It's still Marcus Nispel. Uh, and I'm not straying far from one of the characters on uh, Grammaticus's list. And that is Conan the Barbarian from 2011, starring Jay Momoa. 
Uh, and in his own video, Grammaticus Book says that that movie, that Jason Momoa is fine as a Conan choice, but that the movie is bad in every other way. Uh, and uh, he's wrong. <laughs> this is on many, many other things. He's wrong. It's a wonderful Conan movie. I was all in its corner in 2011 when it when we were rolling up to the point of its premiere. I was writing about Conan every day. I had a Sumerian summer where I was I was hoping to work people up, get them interested, get them out to the theater. I was as disappointed as anybody when that thing didn't take off. I, by this point, Jason Momoa should be playing King Conan in the 10th Conan movie. But no, it never happened. The Fickle Fates of Hollywood, I think I know the reason, one of the reasons why, is there wasn't enough sorcery in the movie. Uh, it's just, uh, Conan didn't have a good enemy in the movie. A, a very seasoned character actor as the bad guy, but not an enemy, not Thulsa Doom. Not, you, you've got to have something for Conan to square off at, and it doesn't really happen uh, in the movie. But nevertheless, it makes it onto my list, Conan the Barbarian. Uh, then number eight would be, it's directed by Tarsim Singh, it's from 2011 as well, and it is uh, Immortals, with a young Henry Cavill uh, before Superman, and uh, is it Stephen Dorff? No, Brad Dorff, uh, and also... also <laughs> Uh, some of you will recognize one of the actors from the Twilight movies who plays Neptune. <laughs> he plays the god Neptune. Uh, it's a strange movie. Very, very strange. Uh, violent, unbelievably violent, unbelievably exciting visually. Uh, I didn't quite know what to make of it and watched it many times. One of the things that really gets to me, one of the things, I love a lot of parts of it. I love a lot of parts of the movie. But one of the things that really gets to me is the very ending. And I don't mean there's an epic fight at the end between these humanoid monsters and the gods of Olympus. Uh, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the very ending. The very last scene in the movie is, I'm not going to spoil it, but it's Hollywood special effects recreating a Tiepolo fresco that would be on the ceiling of a Venetian mansion. I just, I've never seen anything like it before or since. That final moment. I've never seen anything like it before. Uh, it's not the whole... I, I love the whole movie, but I, I just... It had little grace things like that all throughout. Uh, then my number seven... Uh, I don't know that I want to call it a conspicuous omission on Grammaticus's part, because his list was so bad that it almost counts as one big conspicuous omission. But even so... I mean, his heart and soul is in the 80s. The subject is sword and sorcery. There was a movie in the 80s that was sword and sorcery that was not only good, but extremely good. Not just visually like Immortals, but as a movie. It, it, I'm, of course, talking about Ladyhawk. 1985, Richard Donner's Ladyhawk. Where Michelle Pfeiffer and Rutger Hauer play lovers who have been cursed. And the movie, Richard Donner, bless his heart, just decides... Well, I'm setting it in medieval times, but I'm not going to deal with a sorcerer. I'm just going to have a priest curse them. I'm just going to say that the Catholic Church will curse them, that the bishop will just curse them. And the curse is that at night, she's a human woman and he's a wolf. And during the day, he's a human man and she's a hawk. And it's only at the moment of sunrise and sunset that they can see each other. They're in love. They love each other, but they can never touch each other because the bishop wants her. So he curses them that they can always be together, but never be together. It's just at that moment of sunrise and sunset that they can see each other and almost touch before the transformation happens. Uh, it's delightful. Absolutely delightful. Elegant. Beautifully filmed. Beautifully shot. Beautifully acted. It's not just Michelle Pfeiffer and Rutger Howard. Uh, 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 a very young Matthew Broderick. <laughs> a very young Matthew Broderick is in the show, and also Leo McCurrick as a, a drunken monk. Uh, they are wonderful. Absolutely. The whole movie is just wonderful. There are also two set pieces. One in the middle, Rutger Hauer gets a great action set piece, and also one at the end that pretty obviously took many, many reshoots to do, but still works wonderfully. And it's pure sword and sorcery. What is it? Why is it not on Grammaticus's list? I don't get it. Uh, then we're going to move forward to 1992. It's got sorcery. It's got swords. It's Aladdin. I don't know why the Grammaticus books keeps ignoring Disney. Uh, maybe he hates Disney. Maybe he hates his kids. Maybe he hates himself. <laughs> he certainly hates me. <laughs> I'm going to choose Aladdin. 
what need, what need more be said? It is a great movie. Uh, then uh, my number five uh, is the perfect opportunity for me to reiterate what I said at the beginning of this video, which is that Steve is always right. Okay. So if you're feeling the need when I mention number five to quibble, kindly don't. Uh, it's Deathstalker 2 from 1987. Directed by Jim Wynorski. It's a sequel to a very boring standard fantasy movie called Deathstalker that I'm amazed was not on Grammaticus's list. Uh, and it's the pre. It comes before Deathstalker three and Deathstalker four. The the character, the actor who plays Deathstalker in all these movies is different. Deathstalker two is different than any of the others, than the first one or the third one or the fourth one. For all I know, there's a fifth one. Uh, in that, it's funny. It it sends up the whole genre of sword and sorcery movies. It intentionally has its tongue in cheek, and it works quite well. From the movie poster. All the way to the final graphic. It works quite well. So yes, Deathstalker 2. Okay. Uh, then my next one, number four, it's uh, it's from 1999. Director's Antonia Bird. And it might count also as a bit of a fudge. Uh, maybe not quite so much as Pathfinder. It turns out in Pathfinder with Carl Urban that there is nothing supernatural. In, Earth, in, in Pathfinder. Whereas in, in the next movie that I want to talk about, there is something that doesn't happen in the real world. I guess you could call it sorcery. And there are swords, cutlasses, anyway. They're not typically used. There's a movie called Ravenous. I really, really cannot recommend it strongly enough for one viewing. I think you will really like it. It shares something in common, now that I think about it, with Ladyhawk. Almost nothing in common with Lady Hawk. But one thing it shares in common with Lady Hawk is they both have absolutely slam bang soundtracks. You can listen to the soundtrack of Lady Hawk on endless repeat without ever watching the movie. You you don't even have to know the movie exists. You're gonna love it. And Ravenous has an amazing soundtrack. I don't have the top of my head remember who was responsible for either of those soundtracks. But Ravenous is uh it's 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 set in the nineteenth century in, in, in uh, an exclude an, an a distant mil U.S. military outpost uh, where a stranger shows up and there is something wrong with him. And it's catching. He might not be completely human and he's perfectly happy to add others to his ranks. It's got a great cast of characters. It can be funny, but it is moving. It is really, really well done. I'm going to think, I think that it comes close enough to Sword and Sorcery to count, especially if it gives me a chance to recommend it. I have no idea, I should have checked ahead of time, what streaming services any of these things are on. But uh, on my list, well, of course, you're going to watch everything on my list because Steve is always right. Deathstalker 2 is worth your time. If you haven't seen Ladyhawk, you're missing a genuine gem. That might be true for Grammaticus. You might not have seen it. Um, and Ravenous, you'll find interesting. I bet you'll find Pathfinder interesting as well. Uh, then this next one, my next one, my third on my list from 1987, I don't have to worry whether or not you've seen it. Because everyone has seen it. And everyone loves it. Except, apparently, Grammaticus Books, who did not have it on his list of great sword and sorcery movies, which is The Princess Bride. Why wouldn't that be there? Is there not enough sorcery? Or is, are you going to say there's no sorcery at all in that movie? I think there's plenty. Uh, certainly swordplay. Lots and lots of swordplay. It seems close enough to me to put on the list, certainly. And it's it's... It's wonderful. Uh, now, my next list, uh, on, on my list for number two, uh, I'm just going to throw caution to the winds and put Excalibur on there. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Excalibur is awful. If you don't believe me, certainly don't listen to Grammaticus books. And in this case, although I haven't seen his video, I am 100% sure that Excalibur will be on Michael K. Vaughn's video. Don't listen to him either. Instead, listen to your own lying eyes. Find Excalibur on whatever streaming service it's on, sit down with a bowl of popcorn, and take my word for it, some precautionary bourbon, and try to get your way through it. Just try. Wait, that's Arthur? Wait, that's Merlin? Uh, wait, what's going on here? Uh, oh yeah, that, that metaphysical thing you did an hour ago. You're still going on about that, huh? Wasn't this supposed to be exciting? <laughs> 
<laughs> don't take my word for it, but definitely don't take theirs. Instead, just put it on and watch it. Like, like I say with my book reviews, I'm perfectly willing to let to let my judgment stand. Put it on and watch it to see which of us is right. Now, my number two is not Excalibur. It comes from 1967, and it is still it is still King Arthur. It's Camelot. It's Joshua Logan's Camelot, the movie version of the great stage musical. You'll hum every song. You'll your heart will be touched and broken at the end. You will laugh. There's plenty of swords, plenty of sorcery. Camelot from 1967. And then there's my number one choice. Now, I know that in the course of this list, I've been a little hard on eager little Grammaticus. I've slapped him around a little because he's so bad at this. <laughs> he's so bad at this. Uh, the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. The Beastmaster. Uh, <laughs> I know that I've slapped him around a lot, but nevertheless, our number one picks are the same. The Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings movies. I can't think of any other. I mean, we did a fantasy list, but I can't think of... They definitely, to me, overlap into sword and sorcery enough to include them, especially since the urge to recommend them is so strong. So incredibly strong. I could practically recommend them as a cooking show if it'll get you to watch them. <laughs> uh, if it'll, it'll give me a chance to talk about them a little. They are incredible. I am not talking about director's cuts. Okay. I'm talking just about the movies, the theatrical release movies. I'm just talking about them. They are incredible. Absolutely incredible. So there you go. That is a definitive list of the best sword and sorcery movies of all time. And on this list, I want you to give a gamble to Pathfinder. I think you might like it. Not 100% sure, but I think you might like it. I definitely want you to watch Ladyhawk. I definitely do. You will love it. If you haven't seen it, it, it is a rare, tasteful gem from the 80s. Uh, and, well, there's Deathstalker 2. I'm pretty sure that the Deathstalker movies are not being streamed anywhere. They were probably buried somewhere outside of Encino 30 years ago. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm standing by my choices. Now I'm going to, I think Grammaticus mentioned that Michael K. Vaughn was going to join us for this. Uh, out of outrage, I'm assuming. The last two, a couple of times that he joins us, he joins us belatedly out of outrage at our choices and our missed choices. Uh, so I imagine that old man Vaughn will have a bunch of you know, old-timey classics that he wants to recommend. But uh, I'm going to go watch this video and see. It will, the, I will I'll be interested in seeing the rankings and whatnot, but there's one thing I know is there. I don't know what it is about this movie. I just don't. I, I don't know what it is, but it never fails to make these kinds of lists for anybody but me. Uh, so, <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up for now. There you go. Your best sword and sorcery movies. What what genre or subgenre will we hit next? I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> I'll see you then. Thank you, BookTube.